Well, greetings, fellow Bible students. Hope you are well. Uh, to our local church family, I'd like us to apologize for this being uh, a day late. Um, hopefully it's not a dollar short, but you ever had one of those weeks where you were behind on everything? Um, and that's sort of been, I've just been late on everything this week, and uh, but hopefully it'll be worth waiting for a little bit, our study today. And uh, again, we are in a series, um, all of which have been recorded and saved in multiple platforms. So if you're just starting this, you can go back and check the previous lessons out uh, and, um, and sort of follow along that way. But we're in this series where we're looking through um, the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Um, the series is entitled, Let Us Rise Up and Build. And today we're in chapter 5. You know, sometimes <clears throat> all you need is one little word to tell you what's going on in a passage of Scripture. And in Nehemiah chapter 5, that one little word occurs in verse 1. It's the word against says there in chapter 5, verse 1, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. Uh, the last time we opened this book together, we saw Nehemiah and the citizens of Jerusalem overcoming pretty fierce opposition to their work of rebuilding the walls of the city. Uh, by these en enemies that they had uh, from the outside. Uh, today, in this chapter, the, the issue is the enemy within. And really, I'm not sure which one is more difficult to deal with and defeat. Because on the one hand, when you have enemies without, you, you need to pick up a sword, as they did. But on the other hand, when the enemy is within, you have to learn how to get along and, and how to live with each other. So we're talking about the enemy within, which sometimes happens. And uh, you might think about, have you ever locked horns with, with someone within, with a brother or sister? Um, you can die from that, you know. Uh, there's a story about... An, a certain old monastery in in Germany, and it's told that you can see two racks of ancient deer antlers that are displayed there, and these antlers are permanently interlocked. Apparently, the animals had been fighting fiercely, and their horns became so entangled that they could not get themselves disengaged and as a result, both of them died of hunger. So uh, it can be that way even amongst the people of God. And, and these Jews of Nehemiah's day experienced it, and sometimes even Christian brethren experience it. And, and dealing with this threat is just as important uh, to completing the work of God as, as is dealing with external threats. Um, you know, if Satan can beat us from without, or if he can't beat us successfully from without, be sure that he will try to do so from within. And it might be even, an even more common and greater threat. So I'd like us to read a few verses at the beginning of chapter 5, the first five verses as we think about these things, see how it works out in this ancient text and, and how it works out in our lives as well. Nehemiah 5, first five verses. It says, there, there arose a great outcry from the people and from their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were, there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. 
And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it for other men have our fields and our vineyards. But what's this all about? Now, several problems really make up um, the big internal problem that's addressed in this chapter. Verse 2 speaks of people who apparently did not own land. Uh, they didn't have land to farm that belonged to them. And, and because they were busy building the wall, they were finding it hard to feed their families. We can understand that. Uh, they, they need food, and apparently no one is offering help. Uh, verse 3 reflects people who do own land, but because of a famine that had occurred, they had, um, they had gotten a little out of their, uh, you know, they'd gotten uh, very little out of their land, and they were being forced to sell off their possessions like lands and houses in order just to eat. So two different situations have developed. Verse 4 finds a group of people who have gotten into a mess by borrowing money in order to pay their taxes to the king. And then in verse 5, we really start to see how dire the situation is because of all the, the economic distress they're facing, slavery has arisen among the people. And so you have this underclass that has developed. And you have apparently the very, very rich and the desperately poor. And the very, very rich are the very ones that are oppressing and taking advantage of the desperately poor. Well, that just doesn't sound right among God's people. And it's, it's never to be that way. Uh, not in Nehemiah's day, and not, for instance, in first century Christianity, and certainly not among God's people today. Did you know that in the old law, even in a, an ancient time when slavery was common, in the Old Testament law, God had actually said, quote, but there will be no poor among you. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 4. God had said in the law, there shall be no poor among you. And we might remember what it says of the earliest church in the book of Acts, in chapter 2 of Acts, verse 45 how that the church would pool their money together and sometimes even sell possessions and lands that they owned in order to raise money if it was necessary in order to make sure that all the needs of the members were cared for and so that this very kind of thing didn't develop uh, this rich and poor dichotomy in the early church and so that you know the early church took this principle very seriously, and uh, any time a need arose, any time somebody was being neglected, the church responded with great haste and and with effectiveness. You want to see a, a specific example of this? Just read the opening verses of Acts chapter six to see um, how a need was taken care of that had arisen. That's what's spiritual family is supposed to do for one another and it's just something that we need to constantly be reminded that christianity uh, does this christianity is a a one another religion and the church is to be a place where brothers and sisters take care of one another um, so think about this developing in the time of Nehemiah. And what you know about Nehemiah so far from your study, how do you think he felt about this when he heard 
what was going on amongst the people of God. Well, it's not surprising to see that verse 6 of chapter 5 of Nehemiah, where we're studying, verse 6 says he was very angry about it. And uh, very understandable, isn't it? Um, here they are working on this great project. They're so close to completing their mission, which was finishing their work of restoring the walls of the city. And this thing, this problem, could really wreck the whole enterprise. And uh, I think it was an even greater threat than that of Sanballat and Tobiah, those enemies, those outside enemies, greater threat than they ever were. So what, what does Nehemiah do? What is his response? Let's read on for a few more verses, beginning in verse 7, and see what is done. It says there, I took counsel, this is Nehemiah speaking, I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you're doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations are enemies. Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you've been extracting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may, be, may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Well, Nehemiah, as, as we've come to expect, is pretty bold. And he confronts them um, very directly, doesn't he? he? He tells them what they're doing is not right. It's not godly. It's setting a bad example. Uh, he tells them basically to cut it out and to give back what they have taken from one another and just get back to their calling. And he confronts nobles and officials. Did you notice uh, that he added the detail that he, he confronted the priests? The priests were involved in this. Uh, and, and he doesn't leave himself out either. So you know, it, it, it's really wonderful, the response. Would that it always worked this way. But the, the response of the community to this rebuke from the leader of the community, Nehemiah, uh, the response is that they repent. Uh, they say amen to the sermon. It's always good to hear amen, especially when it's sincere. Uh, but but they, they agree with what Nehemiah says, and then they worship together, and they keep the promises that they've made to do better in the future and to, to quit this kind of stuff. That's really the way it ought to work among God's people. You know, when there's a problem, and it's inevitable that there'll be problems among God's people, but when there is, and when it's pointed out in light of the will of God, and especially in light of the Word of God, God's people ought to immediately respond. Um, they should not be defensive. Uh, they should not get their back up. Um, just change for the better 
and commit to do better in the future. That's the way it's supposed to work. And so this crisis was averted in Nehemiah's day, and the work of building that they were engaged in was able to continue because, in part, this fearless leadership of Nehemiah and, in addition, because uh, the people at the time had this healthy fear of God. That's, that's mentioned twice in this passage, in verse 9 and in verse 15, the fear of God that the people had. It is a great motivator, and, and, and so we all ought to be walking in the fear of God on a daily basis. Uh, as I reflect on this chapter of the story, um, there are some things that we certainly should reflect on and internalize uh, in applying the Word of God here. First thing that I would mention is that you know we're reminded that we really have to we we must be the church before we can build the church. Now we're talking about building. And it's important to first be the people of God before you build the house of God. Uh, you know, how we relate to one another, how we treat one another, how we love and forgive and serve one another has a direct bearing on our mission and on its success. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the Jews could not expect to rebuild the walls of the city if they couldn't work together. Uh, that's, that's obvious, isn't it? And we as well, we can't expect to rise up and build if we don't first build and maintain our own relationships and heal any hurts there might be and minister to one another's needs in community. Uh, we can talk about reaching our outside community and serving our community, but it's really just talk if we don't first reach out to one another and love one another and serve one another. We have to be the church before we can build the church. Secondly, this reminds us um, that anytime you have people together, there'll be problems. Uh, in fact, there may well be conflict at times. You can't avoid this. The key is how you deal with it. Uh, if it's ignored, if the problem is ignored, uh, normally it will fester. It will grow worse. Uh, you know, if a problem, an issue is, is pushed under the rug, it will emerge later, and it will usually be a bigger problem at that time. And so sometimes the, the hardest work in church work is not the building of Sunday schools or, or various other ministries. Sometimes the toughest stuff is working on relationships amongst God's people. It, it can be scary and painful sometimes to deal with things like that. Um, and one thing that experience will teach you is that as, as, bad as, as bad as a conflict creator is amongst God's people, you see what I mean, a, a person who generates conflict, as bad as that is, a troublemaker, it may be just as bad or worse to be a conflict avoider. Some people generate conflict. Some people, uh, with all their strength, avoid it, uh, especially if the conflict avoider is a leader amongst God's people. Uh, the leaders of God's people cannot avoid conflict, um, just, just cannot do that and be effective. Now, that doesn't mean as... as um, as members, that we can push it all off on leaders. You know, there's plenty of instruction to, to each one of us. Much of it comes directly from 
the Lord Jesus about taking the initiative taking the initiative personally in solving any problems we might have with a brother or sister who has aught with us in the language of the old King James um, we have personal responsibility in dealing with those things and really will answer to God for failing to do so uh, the stakes are so high you see we're talking about the health and the effectiveness of the kingdom of God when we talk about these things. So uh, don't wait for the other person to come to you. You need to go to them and be tenacious in a kind way about this. You know, if you've been hurt, go and talk it out as Jesus taught, really commanded, uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 18, if you've hurt someone else, go and confess what you did according to what Jesus said. Uh, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, there's just a lot about this throughout Scripture, Old Testament, and New. And why is it so important? Because really, the person whose reputation is at stake is our God. Remember that one of Nehemiah's biggest concerns when he confronted the people with their issues was how were outsiders, that is, people outside of the community of Israel, how were they going to see them? Uh, that's in verse 9 of our text. Again, this is an idea, principle um, found throughout Scripture. In John chapter 17, for instance, Jesus prayed, that lost people would come to know God's love when? When they saw brothers and sisters in Christ living in genuine unity in a world that was divided and full of hatred. They would see something unique and appealing in God's people. And so we need to think about being like Nehemiah and walking in the fear of God to not only avoid the, the reproach of unbelievers, but also to make God attractive to those who need him. And uh, we can do that by living in loving community with each other. And a, a big part of that is our own initiative in, um, in making that happen. So, uh, I ask you, who may be involved in this study, you know, is there anyone that you're in a tangle with? Um, is, is there strife in your relationships, in, in your home, your marriage, in the workplace, with someone maybe in the church, your faith community? Uh, this is not something you want to let, allow to fester Start fixing it in the fear of God. And I, I just really love how the people responded to Nehemiah's challenge uh, there in verse 13 when it says, and the people did as they had promised. Uh, they followed through. And this is one of those places where we just we set that alongside our own lives and how we conduct ourselves and and compare it. Um, are we willing to make a promise, a similar promise, to stop strife in our lives and even in our church life if it's there? Um, and, and to do what it takes to be the people of God that we've been called to be, to make sure we are careful with God's reputation, not even so much our own or the churches, we're talking about God's reputation being on the line as it's reflected in his people. Um, it's an amazing thing to think about that God's reputation in a very real way is in our hands. And it's an incredible risk that God took in setting it up this that way, isn't it? See, sometimes the enemy is without that is outside 
But sometimes the enemy is within. And both need to be dealt with when they arise and, and dealt with in the fear of God. Um, just interesting give and take in this fifth chapter of Nehemiah. Again, thank you for studying along with us. Hope this is a, um, an interesting and, and a challenging study as it has been for me. And we will see you next time when we move on through this series on Let Us Rise Up and Build. Hope you have a great day. God bless you and your family and those you love.